Whenever I talk about climate change to a large audience, there's always somebody in the front row. And he always asks this question, is there any hope? And I turn the question back on him and I say, what is your meaning? What do you mean by hope? And that's the kind of question that makes people hate philosophers. And I said, if you, by that question, mean, do I think that there's a good chance that we will find a way to save this way of life? The answer to that is, no, I don't think so. I am not just not optimistic, I am um, pretty sure we can't do it. Gus Speth, the former dean of the Yale College of Forestry said all we have to do to make sure that we leave a ruined world to our children and our grandchildren is to keep on doing what we're already doing. Well, not only are we keeping on the same sort of path, but we are accelerating it. We are accelerating the extraction. We're accelerating the emissions on and on. So no, if that's your question, do I think there's hope of saving this way of life? I don't think so. But if you have a different question, then ask it. And then he says, well, here's the deal. I don't think there's any hope at all. And I don't think that anything I do will ever make a difference. So I'm just going to keep on buying and burning and uh, figure out that it doesn't make any difference. And at that point, that really gets my response. Because here, I would call him out on that. I will say, for heaven's sakes, why do people do what's right? Because it's going to have some good effect? No, you do what's right because it's right. This whole notion of hope is a very Western concept. We don't find it all around the world. And it's a particularly disempowering concept because it puts us in a real paradox. Because we can say, I have a great deal of hope that we are going to solve this climate change problem, and so I don't have to do anything. That's the moral abdication of hope. Or we could say, I don't have any hope. In fact, I have total despair. And so no matter what I do, it won't make any difference. That's the moral abdication of despair. Hope, despair, you don't have to do anything. But the point that I would make is that that's a logical fallacy. That's a fallacy of false dichotomy. That between hope and despair, there's this broad space that we call moral integrity. Integrity, wholeness, oneness, this matching between what you believe and what you do. So you act reverently towards the earth because you believe it's sacred. You ask lovingly towards the earth because you love it. You don't live a complex, all-consuming life because you don't believe in taking more than your fair share. It doesn't matter if you're going to save the world or if you're not. The question is, are you going to save yourself? Are you going to be able to live a life that you truly believe in? So I would say to this gentleman who has lost hope that the absence of hope doesn't get him off the hook at all, and that he has the power to live a life that he believes in. He has a power to make his life into a work of art that expresses his deepest values. And maybe the world that we know and love will fray and fall apart, despite our best efforts. Or maybe we will find some ways to make a great turning. It doesn't matter what the consequence is. He ought to do what he thinks is right. So that's my answer about hope. Often my audiences have a person who asks this question, what can one person do? And my answer often is, stop being one person. There is a joy and power in joining your efforts with the efforts of similar-minded people. And there's a particular hopelessness and panic in thinking you have to do it all by yourself. So there's really three things that anyone in combination with others can do. And these are the set of actions that are outlined by Joanna Macy, a beloved eco-Buddhist. She says there's three steps. The first step is to stop the harm. Not another marsh will be sacrificed for a Walmart parking lot. Not another river will be dammed for hydroelectric power. Not another estuary will be sacrificed for a liquid natural gas terminal. Not another village will be decimated by a coal train and the children sickened by asthma. It's over, that's it. And that also requires people to be politically active to get the, their representatives in the business of stopping this, the wreckage of the earth. The second, she says, is to think of a better way because it's much easier to turn away from the old ways when you have a beautiful alternative in front of you. A good idea drives out a bad idea. 
And I think we all are pretty clear that we're living according to a set of pretty bad ideas. It's hard to make the movement towards the new ideas if we haven't got a clear notion of them. So this calls for radical imagination. Young people inventing new ways of distributing food by bicycles. Agricultural corporations imagining new ways to raise plants without disturbing the carbon absorbing capacity of the soil. New ways of organizing villages rather than insufferable suburbs. Pull the old ways out by the roots and come up with a better way. So this requires us to put our heads together and fulfill our destiny as the universe's thinking people. We have wild imaginations. Now is the time to put them to work. The third step is to reimagine who we are as human beings in relation to the rest of the world. The time for imagining ourselves as the pinnacle of all creation, the superhero of the natural world, the deciders, the ones who are in control of the natural world, the ones who are separate from and in competition with everything else, the ones who have the unquestioned right to, to decimate species and, and depopulate the planet, that set of ideas is gone. Who are we then in relation to the earth and to one another? Are we deeply kin to the rest of creation? Are we part of this great creative urgency of the universe? How then shall we live? One of the primary blockages to action is this notion that we have met the enemy and he is us. The notion that until we can free ourselves of all the trappings of the fossil fuels, free ourselves of our dependence on fossil fuels, we don't have the moral authority to speak out. I think that's a big mistake, but it's a universal mistake and it really stops people from acting, the sense of guilt. It comes from the Pogo cartoon, which you probably are too young to remember. It comes from the Pogo cartoon where uh, Pogo and Porcupine are in the swamp and uh, they look all around and it's covered with litter and broken cans and busted up refrigerators. And uh, it's Pogo who says, yeah, I think we've met the enemy and he is us. Well, I don't buy it. And I don't buy it because the fossil fuel industry is very eager to say that it's just responding to demand, when in fact it's working very hard to create the demand for fossil fuels, and is working very hard to make it difficult for us to free ourselves or find alternative ways. So when people say we've met the enemy and he is us, I say, yeah, I should be really conscientious about using as little fossil fuels and as consuming as little as I possibly can. But while the fossil fuel industry is externalizing all of its pollution costs on me, I won't allow them to externalize their shame. Because the fact is that um, I'm not asking the fossil fuel companies to hire scientists, so-called scientists, to deceive the public about the effects of burning fossil fuels. I'm not asking them to bribe can the debts or bribe congressmen so that we don't have alternative fuels. I'm not asking the fossil fuel industry to gut alternative transportation. These are things that they're doing as part of their business plan to freeze us in the fossil fuel economy. And while that's the case, we should be very alert to the fact that if we're going to blame somebody for our use of fossil fuels, we might not want to blame ourselves quite so much as we might want to blame the fossil fuel industry itself. So that's my biggest rant. <laughs>